Uh, good morning. Welcome to CSIS's shiny new building. And uh, we're pleased that it's finally up and running. And I'm glad you could be here for this uh, panel, which will be on uh, surveillance and legislation post Snowden. I'm not going to talk much more after this. Uh, the moderator is Ellen Nakashima. She will introduce people. The uh, chairman of our board, however, has asked me to make an announcement about a hashtag. What, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> At CSIS. GSF 2013. So there you go. Oh, up there. Thank you. <laughs> but so I've done my duty here now. And with that, let me uh, thanks for coming. Let me turn it over to Ellen. Hello. Just want to uh, first of all thank CSIS for hosting this conference today. It's a great honor to be here. And the topic could not be more timely. I uh, recently heard from a uh, colleague who was talking to a senior White House official that uh, who quipped, before 9-11, intelligence officers used to get criticized for not knowing enough. Now they get criticized for knowing too much. <laughs> uh, the, the public's concerns about the National Security Agency have surfaced only recently, thanks to the actions of a former NSA analyst, Edward Snowden. Whatever you might think about the merits of his actions, Edward Snowden has single-handedly upended the system. He has provoked a national and international debate about whether the surveillance activities of the world's most technologically advanced spy agency have gone too far. As President Obama has said, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. So now we find ourselves confronted with questions that just six months ago would have seemed unthinkable. Should we extend uh, privacy rights to foreigners in overseas surveillance? Should we put a public advocate on the Foreign Intelligence <coughs> Surveillance Court? Can we even, as the title of our panel rightfully asks, reach a surveillance consensus post Snowden? And if so, what would it look like? Well, we're not going to get to uh, the answers to all those questions here in the next hour or so. But we have, uh, we're lucky to have five of the most highly qualified congressional and public policy experts here to help us think through some of them. So in the interest of maximizing our time for discussion and q and I'm going to just uh, briefly introduce the panelists, and then we'll launch into our discussion. I'm going to start. Uh, the far end, we have uh, Sean Park, who's the general counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee, led by Patrick Leahy of Vermont. Um, next to him is Jim Lewis, senior fellow and uh, director of the Public Policy and Technology Program at CSIS. And Jim's extensive experience in government and out have uh, in he was in the State Department uh, in Commerce and Clinton years out you there, Jim, uh, have made him a go-to guy in, in these uh, public policy issues. Next to him, we have David Granis, staff director of the uh, Senate Select Committee on uh, Intelligence, led by Senator Dianne Feinstein of California, and uh, Lynn Liza Goitin. Uh, Liza, I want to make sure I get your title right. You are the uh, co-director co of the Brennan Center for Justice, Liberty, and National Security Program and former counsel to Senator Russ Feingold. And, and we have here Darren Dick, who is uh, David's counterpart on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, which is led by uh, Congressman Mike Rogers of Michigan. So we have a, a great panel here, and I just want to dive right in. So this is the age of Edward Snowden, where program secrecy cannot be assured and public trust in Congress's ability to serve as a check on uh, agency excesses has diminished. My question to you all is, has the current oversight system failed? Do we need a better structure than the one set up in the 1970s that used Congress as a proxy for full public oversight to protect the secrecy of surveillance programs? And if so, what types of reform would be helpful? Uh, jump ball, but Darren, do you want to just start with that? Sure. Um, first of all, good morning, and thank you, Ellen, for uh, for the question. Um, your question has the current oversight structure failed. I, I would say no. 
the structure hasn't failed at all. In fact, I think um, what's interesting about the Snowden leaks and the programs that have been revealed by the leaks is that in not a single instance has the NSA or any of the other agencies in the intelligence community had to run up to the committee and say, oh, that's something we didn't tell you about. Um, in not one instance has there been a revelation about um, an activity of the intelligence community that the committee has not been informed of. Um, in fact, the only illegal act that has been um, unveiled by the Snowden leaks is the illegal act on the part of Mr. Snowden himself. So um, I would say that, that the, the oversight structure has not failed. And I think there's I think it's important to keep in mind, you know, I've, I've read and I've seen allusions to Church and Pike and um, a need for new investigatory um, committees or panels, but what, what Snowden has revealed um, are a set of authorized, approved, and overseen programs that occur in the context that's very different than the programs that were revealed in the um, times of the Church and Pike Commission. I mean, now we have both the House and the Senate Intelligence Committees. The, the, the programs most of interest in, res, in the uh, Snowden leaks, the 215 and the 702 programs, are also overseen by the Judiciary Committees. Um, these programs are overseen by inspectors general. Uh, the Department of Justice plays a role in in these programs. So it's a very different construct, um, and it's a very, very different set of facts here than, than those facts that were present when Church and Pike were in panel. Mm -hmm. Sean, did you want, Sean and then Liza? Okay. Sorry, sorry, Liza, just no, no, so jump ball, so I figured I'd jump in on this. Jump um, away. J just to, to piggyback, I, I, do, I do agree that there is congressional oversight. There, the intelligence committees obviously have uh, a central role in this. Um, I do think, to your question though, Ellen, there, something didn't go perfectly right. Um, if you've got members of Congress, you know, for better or for worse, saying that they were not aware of certain uh, things that were going on or certain legal interpretations that may have been uh, handed down by the FISA court. So we can talk about where things may have gone wrong or what the gaps may be that need to be filled, but I think there has to be some reassessment as to what uh, the oversight structure is, how things should uh, actually occur, and the, the role of the IGs. I, I agree with what Darren is saying. The IGs are empowered to a certain extent to have oversight over 702 and 215. That's part of why you know, Senator Leahy and others have pushed for IG reports, uh, both for 215 and 702. I think last year, for example, for, for the uh, FISA Amendments Act, one of the uh, parts of the bill, which had bipartisan support, uh, including from Senator Feinstein, was to have a comprehensive uh, look at the 702 program by the ICIG, the Intelligence uh, Committee Inspector General, but none of that has ever happened. And unfortunately, that didn't get passed because folks mm -hmm. decided to go for a straight reauthorization to 2017. Just, just as a quick interjection, do you want to briefly describe for people who might be watching this what uh, 215 and 702 are two of the biggest? Or most yeah, I mean, and, and again, I'm programs. happy to be corrected by the, the mm -hmm. folks from the Intel Committee, but I mean, I think just in, in terms of the kind of bullet points, 215 is a tele telephony metadata program, the bulk collection of telephone metadata here domestically, and then 702's uh, internet content uh, collected overseas or targeting foreigners overseas. Um, and that's also a bulk collection program. I think part of what I wanted to interject, though, is that in terms of the oversight, there is a role for Congress to play, but there are also roles that the independent inspector generals can play, a role for the FISA court to play as well. And I think that's part of why we're also thinking that their structure and their role can be enhanced by having a special advocate and someone who can provide an independent perspective. Okay, thank you. David, and then Liza. Yeah, let me, um, let me first uh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Ellen, thank you, CSIS. Um, I'll, I'll uh, try to be as forthcoming as I can today, subject to all the usual limitations, but I'll be expressing my views uh, and, and no one else's. Um, let, let, let me take a step back from your question mm -hmm. about intelligence oversight. I mean, fundamentally what we're doing here is talking about ways to put checks and balances on executive branch programs that are done in secret nece uh, by necessity in order to uh, prevent the people who we are trying to collect information on from knowing that and evading that collection um, in order to do things like counter-terrorist threats, prevent cyber attacks, prevent proliferation 
of weapons of mass destruction and collect generally foreign intelligence that uh, our nation's leaders need in order to make good decisions. Uh, so, so how do you do that um, with checks to make sure that things are done properly, uh, legally, in a cost-effective manner, and in keeping with sort of our nation's values? Um, the committees that were set up in the late 70s have been doing that continuously. Um, uh, at times there have been fits and starts, but I think that the committees right now are, are filled with members who are, are interested in, in the performance of their mission, even though it's something that they cannot talk about back home. It doesn't bring them additional funding for bridges or anything else like that. It is sitting behind closed doors listening to testimony from intelligence officials about what they're doing. Um, that takes place in the context of inspectors general who do the same or, or a similar mission from inside the, uh, the agencies. The Department of Justice, who in the programs that, that John outlined briefly, conduct reviews every 30 or 60 or 90 days, depending on the nature of it. A FISA court, um, uh, in the case of uh, collection under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, that has been shown through some of the authorized and unauthorized disclosures um, of this program to be enormously involved and to be uh, uh, more than willing to find fault where they believe it is to be found and take action uh, in, in consultation. Uh, so I, th I think the question is not um, simply do the oversight mechanisms work, it's what can be done to, uh, to, enhance, uh, to enhance them um, and to add some amount of understanding about what these committees do and the other oversight mechanisms in place do mm -hmm. without necessarily getting into the substance in all, uh, in all parts. Uh, so I think uh, both the House Intelligence Committee and we put out reports to the extent we can detailing what we've been doing. There are certainly a, a number of very capable national security reporters in this town and others who, uh, who certainly know where we are and, uh, and contact us on a regular basis. Uh, as well as a number of other mechanisms. So uh, are we open to ways to, uh, to, to change that? Would we like more people in order to help carry out that mission? Absolutely. Um, uh, but does the structure fundamentally need to be changed? I, I don't think don't so. Think so. Okay, uh, Liza, did you want to respond to some of that? Or? Sure, um, I think <clears throat> a lot of what's been said is true as far as it goes. I mean, yes, there is oversight by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Yes, there is oversight by committees of Congress. Yes, there are multiple levels of internal review. All of that on, is true. On paper, it looks good. In practice, it's pretty clear it didn't work. Um, I say that, I mean, the main reason I say that stems from something I think we're not going to all agree on, which is that, to me, there are at least two programs that we know of, the bulk collection of telephone metadata and the backdoor searches for Americans' information within pools of, of, of communications content that were acquired without a warrant. Um, <clears throat> these two programs, to me, can only be described as legal uh, by the most creative and contorted possible interpretation of the law. And the fact that this got through the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court on multiple occasions, the fact that it got past the intelligence committees and anybody else in Congress who was paying attention, to me shows that those oversight bodies were not doing their jobs. Um, and that something needs to be done in order to enhance their ability to engage in more effective oversight. Now you don't have to agree with me that these <laughs> programs were illegal to see the problems that happen in oversight. Any, whether people support or oppose the bulk collection of telephonic metadata, I haven't seen a single person, I haven't talked to a single lawyer who read the FISA court's 2013 opinion justifying bulk collection of metadata, who didn't say this is one of the worst reasoned, least supported legal opinions I've ever seen from a judge. It was a results-oriented decision, it was not um, conscientious legal reasoning. There's, there are strong arguments a person could make for the legality of bulk metadata. I think they're wrong. Um, but those arguments were not really even made in, in this opinion. Uh, aside from that, we had the FISA court. I mean, that was one opinion by one judge. But we also have had um, several public statements by judges on the FISA court saying, we have no ability to police the NSA's compliance with our orders. We are entirely reliant on what the NSA tells us, chooses to tell us about what it's doing. 
And on top of that, then we have at least two now public FISA court opinions in which the court says the government has repeatedly misrepresented to the court major, not deliberately, not deliberately as far as we know, not deliberately, but on several occasions, a pattern of serious misrepresentation about systemic noncompliance over collection of information. Yes, it was reported, yes, it was corrected, but then it happened again and again and again. So something is not working with that part of the oversight. When you talk about the congressional oversight, we have members of Congress who said, I never knew about this. Okay, maybe in theory it was somehow made available to them. I was a judiciary committee staffer for a while. I, I have some sense of what it means when the intelligence committees or, or the executive branch even uh, makes information available to members of Congress who are not part of the intelligence committees. It is not a user-friendly process. It is not designed to educate <laughs> members of Congress in any sort of meaningful way. The memos about bulk collection that were made available to members of Congress that were written by the executive branch have been made public. They don't include any of the substantive information about some of the non-compliance incidents. If you read the description of the compliance problems in those memos and you compare it with the FISA court's opinions describing the non-compliance issues, you would think you were reading about two different agencies and two different programs. So if you, when you look beyond the sort of nice words of yes, there's oversight by the FISA court, yes, there's oversight by Congress, you look at what actually happened, mm -hmm. you look at the details, this system has broken down, the oversight system has broken down and needs reform. And finally, very quickly, uh, you know, if you, d if you think that these programs are perfectly legal, then that only underscores the next thing I'm about to say, which I think, I think it would be a mistake to focus too much on solely this question of oversight at the expense of substantive authorities. Oversight is a means to an end. It's a way to determine whether the law is being faithfully followed. And if the law itself doesn't have the right privacy protections, uh, you know, allows the government to collect too much information with too little justification, all the oversight in the world isn't going to cure that problem. Mm -hmm. you, you've raised a host of uh, <laughs> Sorry. important points there, uh, Liza, that um, I think it would be important for the panelists to engage on. So I will um, ask a question, but also let you respond to any of the points Liza made, if you could, um, hopefully <laughs> by answering my question. Um, so do you, do you, how much of an overhaul do you really think we need in terms of um, in domestic surveillance? Um, with, in particular with regards to perhaps the program that really set off this whole controversy or fewer in the pr first place, which is the bulk telephone um, metadata records collection that uh, Liza was talking about, where um, in fact uh, the FISA court did have some, uh, some, some serious concerns with it, but these decisions were, were not made public. And uh, as I think as, as uh, Liza noted that these, their, their issues with the noncompliance were not uh, really captured in, in any of the memos that were shared with Congress. Um, so does this also uh, point to the need for more uh, reform in terms of substantive uh, reforms of authorities? And, and Jim, feel free as well. Let me start. Um, Liza, I think you need to hit your button. Oh, there, got it. Okay, um, a couple quick points. Uh, first, um, I don't like what you read in the press because I think it's mainly spin. Right. There's a lot of detail there, but it's being spun in a way that paints a very negative portrayal of U.S. activities. And there's an intent there, certainly from the people acting overseas. Uh, and so when I read this stuff in the press, it's not a good way to base your debate. And a lot of it is the intent of the people who work at NSA. Um, just it makes me really unhappy to see these misrepresentations. Um, second, I think the oversight system works great. Where it needs reform is probably on transparency. There's a lot that we haven't adjusted. This has been a debate going on since the end of the Cold War. Why do we keep so much secret? A lot of the stuff that's come out could have been discussed in a public way without <coughs> compromising operational effectiveness. The question people aren't asking, and probably because it's too hard, is how much is enough? And so if you were a consumer of this intelligence, you might very well say to yourself, I really didn't need this. I could you know, get the same thing with a subscription to the Financial Times. We aren't having that debate. I mean. That's, that's an important one. It's one that makes me nervous about the idea of what I'm going to call the breakmeister. Somebody whose job 
is to step on the brakes on the FISA court. This is part of the problem we had before 9-11. So that sort of procedural mechanical fix makes me uncomfortable. I'd rather have the larger discussion of what we need. Uh, finally, we could think of an alternate tool set <clears throat> not based on uh, massive data collection and retention that could possibly provide the same security benefits. But to assemble that alternate tool set, too technical a discussion, and it could easily take two or three years. So what are we going to do? So I'd say more transparency, uh, think about research and how to do this a little less intrusively, and maybe avoid uh, procedural approaches that, that are just going to make us a little more vulnerable. Okay. I'll let David go for it. David. Uh, thanks, Ellen. Um, so first, I agree on the need to discuss transparency. I think that's uh, I, th I think that's right, and it's a difficult uh, difficult balance to strike, and it's um, probably easier to see in the big picture than it is on any case by case basis. Um, let me also agree with one thing uh, my, my colleague said, which is that I think we're not going to agree on a lot of these things. Um, <laughs> I, th I think from there you can you can have um, some some disagreements, but let, let's start with a couple of them. Um, on on the programs you mentioned that were reauthorized multiple times in the last part of the the last decade and beginning of this one, Congress acted to reauthorize uh, both the Section 215 um, phone metadata program and the Section 702. Uh, surveillance of, of non-Americans overseas, uh, both under a system of, of court checks. Um, I, I can't speak for the House Committee. I, I believe it's the same, but um, in, in the Senate Intelligence Committee, which shares jurisdiction over these matters with the Judiciary Committee, there were informed debates, amendments raised on, on both of the issues uh, you mentioned, um, the use of searches of 702 data and the collection of, of metadata in large amount. Um, by and large, the result of those amendments were, were 12 to 3 or 13 to 2. Now, we can have a disagreement over where we think the line should have been drawn or what the Congress should authorize and how much security is too much and how much privacy is enough. Um, but the fact is that there, there was an informed debate. In our case, it, it, it was done behind closed doors because when we debate uh, legislation of classified matters, the details matter. And so you have to get in and say, in this case, this information was gathered in this way, and here's how it was used, and here's how it stopped something, or, or the converse. You know. um, the Judiciary Committee also had uh, briefings on the subject. Um, there were briefings available for all members of the Senate. Uh, there were, uh, there, there was a white paper circulated. There were uh, multiple opportunities, including, in fact, as the debate on the floor was taking place to reauthorize this legislation, General Alexander and Director Mueller and DNI Clapper were standing in a room off the floor. So, if members had questions, they were there to answer them. Now, uh, contrary to a couple things that were said, there were compliance incidents noted in the white paper, and they were elaborated upon to anyone. Uh, who, who, uh, who wanted to, to ask about them. Now, there is a limit on how much any one member of Congress can uh, master every single matter that becomes before Congress for a vote. And, and that's an inherent shortcoming of the system. You're not going to change that. Uh, these, in, in the Senate case, 100 senators who are, are acting on everything from environmental policy to health care to uh, discrimination based on, uh, on, on sexual orientation is the topic for, for today, all the way through uh, the collection of records um, under highly complicated uh, systems. Now, that's why we've got committees, and that's why committees focus on the subject matters uh, in their jurisdiction, uh, and they have staff who, who come from the Congress, who come from the executive branch, or who are lawyers from the private practice uh, to look at all of this. And you've got committee votes, and, and the committees make recommendations to the full body. Um, that's how it works across the system. Um, now, now, again, I'm completely open to saying that, that it can be done better. Um, uh, Ellen, to your point briefly, um, mm -hmm. where, where should the line be drawn? Should it be adjusted, um, especially on the program you mentioned about phone metadata? Uh, our committee voted on a bill last week, which means I can talk about it, which I couldn't at a panel last week, um, to make a number of changes, to, to codify uh, a series of protections um, and to add new ones. So for the first time, if our bill would, be, uh, would, would become law, 
you would have the FISA court getting to review every single determination within a prompt period of time when a uh, phone number is believed to have a reasonable articulable suspicion to be associated with terrorism. If the court says no, then they can erase all of the results from that query. Um, I doubt that will happen because like the, like the case that's been built up over the past 30 years, the government is extremely careful in its exercise of these authorities. Uh, the reason that so many applications are approved by the FISA court is because they are scrubbed at every level from the operator to the an NSA attorney to an, or an FBI attorney up through the Department of Justice and they don't like to lose and they don't want to do anything that is going to violate the trust of the court so they make sure that they've got a belt and suspenders for every single application they put through. But the FISA court will take a look at it and send it back. There will be additional information put out in public. Uh, there will be additional checks on the flexibility for the use, um, which will roll back its operational uh, flexibility and effectiveness. But in the, in the mind of our members anyway, uh, it is appropriate to sacrifice the, the last 5 or 10 percent of effectiveness in order to gain uh, additional trust in the system and make sure that it is uh, uh, supported within the Congress uh, as well as in the public. That's a perfect lead into you, Sean, since your committee also has, uh, is working on a bill that would, uh, in, uh, very, in stark contrast to the Senate Intelligence Committee's approach, would actually end bulk collection. Right, right. right. There's a, a, a significant area of disagreement. Let me, if I can, mm -hmm. jump back, though, I think, sure. you know, to the title of the, the panel, consensus, right? I mean, I think there is consensus. I think we are hearing and we've heard that there is consensus when it comes to folks wanting there to be transparency. Uh, you know, strong, vigorous oversight by the congressional committees as well as by the FISA court. I think those are areas where, you know, Senator Feinstein, Senator Leahy have in the past and I think will continue to work together um, to try and, you know, build that up. There may be disagreements as to how far to go on some of these issues, but I think particularly on the inspector generals, that's something where we have not seen comprehensive inspector general reports. I, I know there's, you know, language in the statutes about that, but we really haven't seen the reports come out that are, are adequate, and I think that's something to push on. I, I want to comment on something that Jim said, though, in terms of, you know, the spin that, you know, we're allegedly hearing um, from reporters and from others. You know, I, I don't disagree that there are certainly folks who are, you know, writing, uh, you know, columns or reports out there that may have their own spin on things, present company accepted, obviously, but um, <laughs> I, I don't think it's also accurate to somehow, you know, leave folks with the impression that the NSA or the executive branch is not doing their own fair share of spin. Uh, when it comes to the substance of the bulk metadata collection uh, and the arguments being made and that were made by the administration as to why uh, this telephony metadata collection should continue uh, and the value of it, it went from dozens of terrorist plots and attacks that were thwarted <clears throat> to 50 plus to 54. Um, Senator Leahy asked repeatedly in a succession of hearings as to, you know, the value of these programs, or this particular program, it went from dozens to 54 to, uh, I think, 12 uh, in the homeland down to <clears throat> pretty much one or two uh, that had a but-for causal relationship between the 215 mandate program and a plot or an incident. Now they're calling them events or incidents. And if effectively, it was $8,500 being sent by an al-Shabaab, not, I, frankly, not even um, defined as to whether or not that person was an al-Shabaab member. Somebody. Uh, who was in San Diego sending 8,500 bucks to uh, folks in Somalia who were allegedly part of al-Shabaab. That is essentially the case that is now being touted as the reason or the justica justification, one of the justifications for that. So in terms of the spin and the characterization as the value of the bulk metadata, metadata collection, I think it's important also to see what the administration has said and to weigh that against the invasion of privacy or at least the potential invasion of privacy um, that folks are talking about when you're talking about millions and millions of phone records that are being collected on a daily basis by the government, folks who have no connection whatsoever to terrorism or to a foreign agent. Everybody in this room, frankly, your phone metadata has been collected over the past number of years, whether or not you have any connection whatsoever to terrorism or not. And that's what Senator Leahy is very concerned about, along with a good deal of members on the Senate and the House side who are concerned about this program. We can talk about, and we are debating, what it, where is you know, the line? When is enough enough? I think that debate is happening. It has happened for a number of years. And I think that's the question is, sorry, but based on the legal reason, I want to get back to what Liza was saying because it's important here. The legal reasoning, the, the justification is relevance. 
there is no limiting principle to that notion of relevance as set forth by the administration and as, frankly, ratified by the FISA court up to this point. It could be your financial records. It could be internet metadata. It could be the geolocation of your cell phone uh, communications. That is all basically relevant under the uh, legal analysis set forth by the administration. The question is, where is enough enough? Okay. Darren. The, uh, <clears throat> the disadvantage of being the House member, the representing the House up here, is my Senate colleagues are used to their, uh, their debate rules, and the length of time they get for debate. <laughs> um, we'll have a little timer here. I say that jokingly. I spent most of my time on the Senate side before coming to the House. Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I, I want to uh, associate myself with several of the remarks David made. I think he, he made some good points about um, oversight and, and how it works and how the Congress has acted um, in reauthorizing these programs. And secondly, with regard to the fact that we can point to um, incidents being reported to the court and acted on by the court. Um, is not demonstration of oversight failing, that's demonstration of oversight working. And in all of these instances, this was brought to the court by NSA. Um, NSA self-reported. Um, they explained why these, these incidents were occurring, and then they took corrective actions, and the court monitored the implementation of those corrective actions. And then the court continued to approve the, the programs going forward. So I, I think that's evidence of oversight working, not evidence of no oversight or failed oversight. Additionally, with respect to the question about how much reform of the 215 program is needed, uh, unlike David, I, our committee has not yet acted, so I don't want to prejudge or, um, what action the committee might take. I'll just say, first of all, the, the chairman has made clear on the floor that he is um, open to and, in fact, is, has charged us with pursuing a number of of uh, initiatives to increase transparency and oversight of these programs. And, and we've been working on that this, throughout the summer, um, and I'm sure he'll want us to, he'll want the committee to act on that soon. But I think in, in determining what, what changes to make to the program, and this gets, this gets to the issue of how many cases was it but for help, causally helpful, and the, 215 needs to be understood as an insurance program in some respects. Um, it, is, and it is a program by which we collect um, telephone data, and analysts use that data to do call chaining to, establish, to, to identify patterns. And those patterns identify risks or threats. Um, and then that, that information is passed to the right um, elements of the executive branch to take action, whether it's overseas or in the United States. So in judging what changes to make to 215, one has to understand that that's what the program does. Um, and so you can, you can make changes, but in making those changes, you are then agreeing to change your risk um, tolerance. So. While it may be useful, while you may only point to one definitive threat, although I, I'm not saying that that's an accurate portrayal, but for the sake of argument, if you say that only one threat was stopped, if the threat would have resulted in the deaths of 3,000 people, is that a risk that you're willing to take? And then with respect to, to one other point, one other description of the program that's been made up here, that, that it involves privacy, uh, again, we can debate whether or not we like the program. Uh, we can debate whether or not we're comfortable with the program. But the program, as described multiple times on the public record, um, is, results in the government getting less information than is available in the phone book. So this is not, and it is, it is all it deals with is business record information. So this is information that the Supreme Court has ruled we do not have a legitimate privacy interest in. So I think it's important that while we may not like the 215 program and while the scope and size of it may be bothersome, it's not, uh, it does, it's not a, an invasion of privacy rights as defined by the Supreme Court. Can I jump in real quick, Ellen? Sure. Let me just jump sure. in real quick. All right. This will be quick, I promise. So no I Senate rules a, for you. 
I was at a, a meeting with a, a Five Eye partner where the most senior intelligence official for that Five Eye partner, this was a closed meeting, um, said that because of the programs we're talking about, they had been able to stop four mass casualty events, right? Now which that's pro a, which program though? Um, 215 or 702? He didn't specify. Exactly. He just said that, <laughs> but you're going to tinker with a system in ways that create risk that you don't understand. And then we're going to stand back and say, oh, one mass casualty event, that was okay. You know, and so I don't feel comfortable with that. And I think we're not having a good discussion. But I think it's important to have a good discussion risk. about, sorry to jump in, a good okay. discussion to have about which program you're talking about. I don't disagree. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're talking about tinkering with substantive programmatic pieces of you know, the, the surveillance mm -hmm. authorities, yes, absolutely agree, which is why there have been discussions about 702 and 215 separately. But when you conflate the two, that's when you have, frankly, not a, 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 an honest, intellectually honest discussion about what the value of those programs. So I think it's important to parse that out, which is part of the reason why we're trying to get you know, the administration to be more specific about the value of that. Well, I think well, it's interesting, it's interesting mm -hmm. that you had uh, more transparency from a Five Eye partner than you have in the U.S., so that reinforces mm -hmm. a consensus here. <laughs> he, was, was, he was talking about both programs, though, and so I don't want to know that we're going to tinker with one and increase risk. I'm not willing to accept that risk, necessarily. But are there compromises? With respect to the uh, phone metadata program, uh, maybe, Darren, you can elaborate a little on this because it is uh, your Vice Chairman, uh, Dutch Ruppersberger, of your committee, who's been exploring the idea of uh, having companies maintain the data uh, rather than having NSA hold the, amass the database, which is, I think, the, the issue that concerns the, the, the privacy and civil liberties community the most, which is having the intelligence agency hold that pot of, of data, the haystack, billions of phone records of Americans. Is there an alternative to that with the companies? What do you well, well I'd, I don't want to speak for Mr. Ruppersberger. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that that's an issue that he has charged his staff with looking at and that they are um, they are looking at it closely and, and doing doing their due diligence before making a final determination. Um, I will say that that is an issue that we on the majority side of the staff looked at earlier in the summer as well. Um, and again, I don't want to prejudge what the committee might do, but um, initially the idea of having the data held at the at the company seemed like it might be an easy solution to address one of the chief concerns. But the, the more we delved into it, the more we identified a number of issues with it that are issues that members will have to confront and make decisions about. I mean, there is, um, if, if you have it held at the um, service providers, there's issues about how, um, quickly that information can be accessed and searched and utilized for analysis and how it's presented to the government for, for their use. And so then there's questions about how those uh, requirements are addressed. Are they addressed through contract? Are they addressed through statute, mandate, things like that that would have to be addressed in any alternative um, at which the telcos retain the data. Additionally, there's, um, and then I'll yield. Uh, additionally, there's, um, there's, there's privacy concerns um, that have been voiced to us by some if, if the data is held at the telcos. Um, for, the, for the program to be as effective as it is now, there would have to be a certain construct about you know, collecting the data together. Um, and people are, are, are concerned about the companies sharing that data um, with each other. Um, there, there is an extensive, as we've alluded to now, there's an extensive oversight of, of the NSA's uh, database that probably doesn't exist in the private sector because they don't, they don't have the need for that. Um, and so there's questions about how secure um, and how protected that data would be if it were retained at the uh, telcos. Okay. Dave, two fingers, right? Chief? Oh. Yeah, just very briefly. Um, the, the, I, for, first of all, I agree with Darren. We, we, we took a very close look um, and got reports on, on, on the feasibility of this model. Uh, at the end of the day, you would, in either system, regardless of who holds what's colloquially, colloquially being called the haystack, the NSA would be getting the same needles. 
whether they hold it or, or the, the phone companies, either way you, won't, you would have a system of queries in which, in, in which reports of phone communications would be provided to NSA analysts who would do something with it. Um, so the question really is, do you, is there a fundamental trust in the phone companies as opposed to the government? Um, I would note that the, the title of the panel talks about surveillance. It doesn't talk about government surveillance. And so something that our members have been wrestling with as looking through this is phone companies have large amounts of, of data, uh, tele, uh, internet companies have vast amounts of data, and they all do things with it for their own interests, whether it's producing a phone book or whether it's selling lists based on you know, customer behavior or, or whatever else. And all of us have a digital footprint out there and fingerprints that, that can be um, uh, followed and, and tracked, um, except in the case of the government, there are very careful rules about what you can do and how you can do it and who has to approve it and, and then you know, what the ultimate disposition might be. Um, and, and the legislation and policy on how that is controlled in the private sector is lagging quite sure. a bit behind. Um, so part of what we ought to be thinking uh, about here, I think, is um, not just government access to information and use of information for very specific national security policies, but also a, ge a more general conversation about what it means to live in a digital society and who's able to do sure. what with what. Maybe have sort of a, a general Data Privacy Protection Act, which is the Europeans are trying to urge us to do. Um, I, I wanted to ask sorry, sort of. I, sorry, I've been waiting. I just wanted to jump in and, on section 215 and the sure. of the program because I think. Hello. Um, I, I wanted to, to talk a little bit more about what Section 215 does and doesn't do because I think it's important that we all have that understanding before, before we go on. It contains, this database contains vastly more information than you get in a phone book. If you look in a phone book, you are not going to get everyone I've called, when I've called them, how long those conversations lasted. That's not in the phone book. Now it's true, the phone book has my name and my address, and the NSA only gets telephone numbers. It is child's play to connect a telephone number to a name and an address. I mean, forget about getting an NSL, a national security letter, to get that information. You can Google it. Google your own telephone number. You'll get your name and your address. So it's, it's, not, it's, it's, a, it's a trove of extremely personal information that in some cases can be even more personal than the content of the communications themselves. And the other sort of myth I want to dispel is this idea that we can either have bulk collection and be able to access this data or no bulk collection and therefore no access. What happened before bulk collection is that if you had a basis to query the data, because right now the NSA doesn't query the data unless it has reasonable articulable suspicion. So beforehand, if you had reasonable articulable suspicion, you would take that same phone number and instead of plugging it into all the data the NSA holds, you would go to the telephone companies who do keep that data and you would give them the number and they would give you back the exact same information that the NSA would have gotten on its own. The only two distinctions that, have, that anyone has articulated publicly between these two ways of, of doing it is that the telephone companies don't always keep the information as long it's sometimes 18 months uh, instead of five years, which is how long the NSA ta keeps it. And it may be a little more cumbersome because you may have to go to multiple providers in order to pull the information together. Now, in terms of how cumbersome it is, you know, I, I think that is absolutely a price we should be willing to pay for the, for the added security of not having the NSA have all this personal data. But more to the point, there have been no examples put forward of cases where Section 215 bulk collection was used where going to the telephone companies would have taken too long and whatever plot was thwarted would have happened. No examples. Similarly, there have been no examples put forward where the information that was collected through bulk collection was more than, was between 18 months and five years old, such that the plot could not have been intercepted if documents older than 18 months had been uh, discarded. Unless or until we see that kind of proof, there has been no persuasive case made for any value added of bulk collection by the NSA rather than letting the telephone companies continue to keep these records as they do in the course of business and using Section 215 the way it was used right up until 2006, which is to go to the telephone companies with your telephone number and get the information from them. David, Darren, before I move on, do you have any information to the contrary to what Liza said about 
Yes. The, oh. Um, <laughs> uh, Take the floor. Uh, 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 we, we have seen lists of information where specific uh, plots or, uh, or arrests were made on the basis of uh, business record information going back beyond uh, 18 months. Uh, we have also seen cases where a specific query was done that uh, the timeliness was at issue and going to the phone companies would not be feasible uh, for those specific cases. Um, I ha happy to grant that not all that information has been uh, made public. There Why are not? still some uh, classified information um, and, and plots that have not been declassified. Um, Presumably I, what you just said is not classified or you couldn't have said it. The administration has not said what you have said, they have every incentive to say that in order to defend the legality of this program. There has been no, in fact, the administration has basically come down to saying that Section 215 was useful in maybe one case. I, I, I'm, I'm, not sure the, I'm, I'm not sure the government has said that. I am, I am here uh, invited to speak on behalf of, of, of the committee and the Congress. Um, I, I, I believe that my statement was unclassified. I'm quite certain of it. Um, if the government would like to uh, would like to release more information, I'm, I'm sure they're welcome to do so. Uh, and one final point: um, it, it is uh, commonly uh, accepted and uh, and and easy for anyone in this room to do to go and Google their own phone number. That doesn't actually mean that the law would allow or internal regulations would allow an NSA analyst to do the same thing. In fact, they can't. If an NSA analyst has a number and they're interested in it and it's a U.S. person or they have any reason to think it's a U.S. person, what they do is they turn it over to the FBI who goes and gets a national security letter or a grand jury, a grand jury subpoena and as part of an authorized investigation uh, goes through the investigative steps. Now, at the end of the day, after a legal process is obtained, maybe they can Google the information. Um, but, but the fact is that there are enormous uh, controls placed on the NSA, which are appropriate in this case because they have enormous access to information. Um, uh, but they, like the rest of the government, operate under the principle of following the least, least intrusive method, meaning that you have to start from the uh, thing that is going to impact privacy of your American target the least and move up through the chain to the point where at the end of a full investigation, you're talking about things that could involve a physical search of someone's house or something that anyone who watches procedural dramas on TV is well aware of all the time, but that with the intrusiveness of the search, so also goes the, the legal uh, requirements um, and, and checks. So you get the, the court sign off, you're getting probable cause orders, uh, you're getting AG approvals for various things. Um, uh, so this, the system works in that way and, and people should not be confused uh, by the capability to get information or use information and the authority to do it because especially in the NSA's case um, and as well as other intelligence agencies, they are very different things. Okay. This, this gets to John's point about spinning though. It's true both sides spin. It's just that one side is better than the other. <laughs> Which and, side? Well, uh, and it also leads back to the transparency issue, which is it's hard for people to have a reasonable discussion of the benefits and risks of these right. programs if you don't have as much of the record as possible. And I kind of think that's sort of a duty for espionage in a democratic society is you have to get more data out there so people can make up their minds. And we don't really have enough uh, at the moment to have a reasonable discussion I in agree. public. Okay, Sean. Uh, Ellen, I know you want to move on, but Let just on 215, I think it's important. I, just to go back to what we were talking about before is not just the oversight. I mean, I think oversight obviously is a discussion we've had at length here, but also in terms of the substance of the 215 program and the statute itself. And It's not just about business records. The statute talks about any tangible thing. So we're not just talking about business records. Re business records you know, the phone business records are what are being collected right now under the two current 215 telephony metadata program, but the statute itself does not restrict the government to that. The government can seek an order for any tangible thing. Now, you know, I ma don't imagine that the government is going to be seeking, you know, to collect every single car or every single refrigerator or whatever it might be, but when it comes to financial transaction data, when it comes to internet metadata, when it comes to social network um, participation and, and information there when it comes to cell site location. That information can be obtained if the government p could potentially be obtained and fa frankly it was obtained in terms of email metadata up until 2011 as was disclosed um, under the PRTT statute but still it was disclosed under essentially the same standards. So the question I think 
to put to maybe Jim and David and, and Darren, because I have a feeling I know where Liza will come out on this, <laughs> would be, you know, it, it, not just in terms of the bulk phone records collection now, but then also what impact does this have if we continue to kind of um, keep with the, the statutory framework and the standard right now, what does that mean for surveillance into the future? And what does that mean as technology, frankly, develops and, and mm -hmm. there's more metadata out there? Um, every, I mean, David was talking about the digital footprint that we all have that's just getting larger and larger every day. Where is the line? When is enough enough? And I think that's an important policy decision that needs to be take place as we engage in this debate. In fact, what you just said gets at my next question, um, and, and David was also sort of describing the series of limitations and protections put on once data is collected. But I kind of want to get back to these sort of first principles about the, with, with advances in technology, what we have seen over the years is a fundamental shift in our approach to surveillance where you collect as much as you can collect it all if you can, but collect as much as you can at the front end, and then you put the limitations and the privacy protections on at the back end or after it's collected. When it comes time to search, use, or disseminate. Uh, a lot of 9-11 uh, gave impetus to this, but uh, there is some you know, sense that NSA, given its mission and, and the fact that it has great technological tools at its disposal, would be inclined to try to collect as much as it can in order to have the largest amount of, of data possible to sift through for the needles. Uh, the question is, do we need to rethink this approach at all, the collect first, minimize later? Do we need to think about putting more finely tuned restrictions on what can be collected at the front end? in the name of foreign intelligence. Well, I, I blame all you people who uh, went paperless because we used to just be able to fish this out of your garbage can. Now we have to, you know. Um, and it's a good question. The NSA's normal approach is to collect as much as possible. And I was thinking about that this morning for the panel is if you were uh, a customer, would you always say, no, 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 that's okay. I don't want more information. You know, n customers never say no, right? More is always better. And that might be a mistake. We have a cryptologic enterprise that is based on as extensive a collection as possible. You could think of other approaches that might produce the same results. But what worries me is the transition to folk, the things that replace resource constraints with policy constraints. During that transition, we might face additional risk. Eliza? Yeah, I mean, I think there are. Um Somehow this mic, I cannot wrap my mind around it. Um, there, there are sort of two related shifts that have happened, and, and the first shift is that um, basically since the 1970s, before the 1970s, there were, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, widespread abuses by the intelligence community during the early part of the Cold War. The FBI, the NSA, the CIA, the Church Committee revealed these. There was a lot of targeting of political dissent and social justice activism. When these abuses were revealed, a set of laws and policies were put in place that enshrined what I think of as a kind of golden rule, which is that the government may not, law enforcement and intelligence agencies may not collect information on Americans unless it has some individualized level of suspicion, either suspicion of criminal activity or of a connection to a foreign power um, in order to, to make that collection. And that golden rule um, across a number of laws and policies was in place for decades. I think it worked very well. The 9-11 Commission found fault with a lot of government practices, but it never said we need more information about U.S. citizens with less basis for suspicion. Um, but what hap has happened since 9-11 is that there has been a steady and swift erosion of the level of suspicion that's required before law enforcement and intelligence can collect on U.S. person. And in some cases, that level has gone down to zero, which effectively is the case for Section 215. Um, what has been put in place instead is these back-end restrictions on, that come into play at the point of access or use. And I think this is a dangerous shift for, for a few reasons. First of all, possession is nine-tenths of the law. As soon as the NSA has the data in its possession, fundamentally we are reliant on the NSA to police itself. And yes, there are reporting requirements, absolutely, to the court, to Congress, but these oversight bodies have limited ability to um, really 
conduct discovery and look behind the representations that they get. And so in the court, the FISA court has, has said as much. Um, and so you were relying on self-policing and that works great until it doesn't. And you know, that's the lesson that we take from history is eventually it doesn't work and that's why we're, we're supposed to have external oversight and not just internal self-policing. Um, but the other, uh, another risk to this back end set of protections is the inevitable mission creep. The, the pressure to use this huge pool of data for more and more uses will be irresistible. We've already seen this. In 2008, 2009, the minimization requirements for uh, FISA, for uh, FAA data, Section 702 data said um, the, the government may not look for US citizen, US person information in this pool of data. And the government said, we don't need it, we don't want it. The minimization requirement said you can't do it. Well, guess what? In 2011, total change. Now the NSA can look for uh, US person data in Section 702. That's the kind of creep that will inevitably happen. And the moment there is a major terrorist attack on US soil, all of these privacy prote back end protections that we are so carefully weighing and discussing today will be gone or at least some of them will. So th there's inevitable pressure once the data is collected to use it. And finally, very briefly, there is such a thing as too much data. I mean, the NSA slides that we've seen from Snowden say this, useless data gums up the system. Just technologically, it gums up the system. It also creates noise that obscures real threats, and it vastly increases the risk of false positives, of people being flagged as having some kind of suspicious connection that in reality is perfectly uh, you know, coincidental or innocuous. And, and that has real, real implications for those people's lives. Thank so. Darren. Darren. Yeah, on, an, on, the, on the last point, I think, I think that's right. There can be too much information. Um, and NSA is focused on achieving their mission, not just on hoovering up all the information that's out there. Um, that's why their own slides point out that they don't want all the information. Um, and with regard to the the this the allusion to um, abuses by the intelligence community, I think it's instructive that um, over the last decade. Um, 12333 collection, in the, in the area of 12333 collection, there have been 12 incidents of intentional misuse of that authority. None of those were um, the NSA collecting someone's, someone on, for political re purposes. Um, it was 12 individuals who were assigned to or worked for NSA who misused their access to the NSA system to check up on their uh, girlfriends, wives, um, one, one guy was just trying to improve his own capabilities, misunderstood the rules. So in 10 years, 12 intentional misuses of the system. That's starkly different than Church and Pike, and that needs to be kept in mind as we have this debate and as we consider what risk we're willing to accept. Uh, and additionally, no intentional misuses of the 215 or the 702 um, authorities in that same time period. So that, that's instructive. Additionally, with respect to whether or not oversight has the ability to conduct sufficient reviews of what's going on, before June 5th, between January of 2011 and June 5th of this year when the first Snowden article was published, the House Intelligence Committee had had 294 different interactions with NSA alone. That's staff being out at NSA headquarters. That's staff being at NSA collection operations around the world. That's members being at NSA or, or at other NSA locations around the world. Um, so over 294 interactions by the committee with NSA alone. Um, and that number has only grown since June 5th, obviously. So, um, and then with respect to this idea of should we change how we collect. I think uh, General Alexander has made clear in his testimony, his public testimony uh, since the Snowden leaks, look, if he's open to different constructs. If there's a different way to do this, he's open to it. Again, because it gets back to the, the fundamental notion that the folks at NSA um, who have all taken the same oath we have taken to uphold the Constitution uh, are, are more interested in achieving their mission than just 
collecting information for information's sake. So, um, but, it, but it, as I think Jim was alluding to, as we consider other ways of doing it, the question is what risks are you willing to accept in your national security posture as a result of that change? Ellen, let me try to take a different stab at answering the question I think you asked. Um, and, and first, to go back um, to, to Elias' point, I'm aware of a couple of golden rules. One of them uh, in Congress, he who may, has the gold makes the rule, which is an appropriation saying they're at a different panel right now talking about defense sequester and, and budget shutdown. Uh, the other one is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, which I think blatantly does not apply, generally speaking, to the intelligence community. Um, the intelligence community is out there trying to collect information, doing things that are clearly in violation of other countries' laws in order to collect information for our government. And they are doing the same thing against us, generally not as well. Um, so the question is not a legal one. It's, it's, not, um, it's not, is it lawful to collect all of this information, because it's been repeatedly uh, been upheld in, in the case of FISA collection uh, by a special court. Um, generally, these are not uh, violations of specific law, but they are you know, the province of the executive branch under appropriate oversight under the Constitution, et cetera. Um, the question is a policy one over whether in all cases it makes sense uh, and is a good idea to go out and collect everything that can be collected. Uh, and we are seeing right now a very public controversy about the collection on foreign leaders. Um, and, and partly that boils down to the question, is it a good idea to collect information on national leader X of an allied country? Um, and it's a cost-benefit analysis. How much information are you going to get? Um, how, how valuable is that to the President, the Secretary of State, our ambassador in that country? Um, on the other side, um, there's, there's a couple of considerations. Number one, if it is found out, how, you know, what's going to hit the fan? Um, and then on the other side, you know, is, is it possible to engage in some kind of agreement, as we've done with some, some countries, uh, to say, look, we're allies, um, we, we generally trust you, you generally trust us, we're going to tell you what we want to tell you, and you're going to tell us what you want to tell us, and we're going to let that go. Um, so that, that's really a policy decision, and right now I know the administration is weighing that, um, and they have a couple of, repo uh, of, of reviews underway. Um, you know, Senator Feinstein, the chairman of, of our committee, has announced a, a review of collection that will look at questions like this. Um, and, and there will be additional oversight. Uh, but I don't want to be uh, confused as to, to say that this is in any way a legal or technical question. Mm -hmm. There is an enormous capability, and there is a, a, a fair amount in, in law to allow for the collection as, as long as it is handled appropriately and subject to the appropriate guidelines. It's a policy one, um, and that, that should probably be both an internal executive and congressional and public uh, discussion about about what we as a nation want to do. So, Jim, public policy expert, what do you think? Should should there be uh, more uh, sort of an agreement, uh, like a no spy agreement between the U.S. and uh, the, the foreign leaders in terms of spying on their communications or their personal communications? What about those of their citizens? As a policy matter, should we be extending? Uh, privacy rights to non-U.S. persons overseas who do not enjoy constitutional privacy protections now because of the risk of political blowback and the, uh, the, the, the risk of further diminishing trust in the government. I, I, I know Chan Montano wants to say something, so I'll okay. be quick. But, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is part of the problem might be trust in the congressional oversight. And so what would be a repair there? You know, that we have an oversight system. People don't seem happy with it. The second one that bothers me a lot is this the threshold issue. So what is it, reasonable, articulable suspicion? Where did that come from? Um, it really didn't come from the Constitution. So maybe thinking about what's the threshold for collection. On foreign intelligence, um, this is not an area that international law has touched before. There's, I think, a very small number of international laws mainly saying you can be shot if you're caught out of uniform. Um, International law did not touch this. International law does not constrain it for a reason, and that is that sovereigns don't want to be constrained. And so if there's a reciprocal way to do this and say, yes, we agree, sure, that might be worth ex exploring. But it's the issue of reciprocity that bothers me. 
Can you think of other the people who spy on us saying, okay, we'll now give American citizens the same protections? Well, for some of them, that would be easy. I mean, I think the Russians would be happy to extend the same protections to us that they give their citizens, but that's <laughs> re really not what I had in mind. Uh, sorry, just to go back to one of the questions you were asking before, um, and a comment David was making regarding, I, I agree, there are policy decisions that need, need to be made. I, I don't believe, though, that the legal questions have yet been resolved. Um, I know the administration and maybe some folks on the panel would like to, you know, believe that they have been fully resolved, but when it comes to, for example, Section 702, Vice Amendments Act, part of the reason it wasn't uh, resolved is because the Supreme Court um, rejected a case based on a standing issue. Well, now it's somewhat been revived because, frankly, the, uh, some of the litigants weren't really aware of, uh, you know, some of what was going on, and, and there potentially will be, I think there, I, I, I strongly believe there will be a constitutional challenge to that. So I think from a constitutional perspective as well, there are some issues to still be resolved. Same when it com comes to 215. I think at the FISA court level, certainly there have been successive opinions now that I tend to agree with. Liza seem to be somewhat more results oriented. That's my personal view, not my boss's view on that. But um, I, I think that that also could potentially be reviewed. Uh, whether at the FISA court of review level or uh, at the Supreme Court level, potentially in the future. I don't think those issues are resolved. I think, frankly, it, it's something that goes to what um, Darren was talking about, also from a policy perspective. What's the risk, I guess? You were talking about the insurance policy analogy of, of uh, in, in a way. Yes, I mean, we have to talk about what risk folks are willing to accept. and. You know, certainly when it came to the email metadata collection um, that was happening under the PRTT program, there was a de decision made to terminate that. Um, many people would argue, well, it's better to have all that data anyways. It's a, it adds to our insurance policy. It's a better insurance policy, if you will, to use your analogy. It's better to have all the cell site location uh, data. It's better to have all the internet met metadata. It's better to have all this information to bolster the insurance policy. There are determinations that are made not to you know, collect certain types of data by the NSA and other members of the uh, IC. And so where is that line? I don't think, um, frankly, from Senator Leahy's perspective, that the administration has adequately justified the utility of Section 215 telephony bulk metadata to justify the collection in bulk of all this, of all these phone records. That's a policy disagreement, right? But I think, I don't think it, it's fair to say also just because we're looking to tighten up the standards in 215 that it's, you know, suddenly going to lead to X number of attacks or X number of people dying. Not, I'm not saying, Darren, you're saying that, but I think that there are some people who characterize it that way. And I think it has to be a kind of very deliberate, careful, thoughtful process of trying to hash out where the distinctions are, what the policy considerations are, and what the, what the cost is, not just to the intelligence community in terms of what information they may be giving up, but frankly also to the privacy of Americans. I think there is a privacy element here because I know that we want to think that it's just the information that's in the phone book. Well, even what folks are saying on the panel about, well, we don't want to give it to the, or leave it at the phone companies because there's a private privacy consideration. Well, if there's not a privacy consideration really, and it's just the phone book information at the NSA, why is it not okay just to leave it at the, at the companies? And again, my boss and I, we're not taking a position on that right now, but that's a consideration as to the fact that what Liza was going to, the connections between the, the numbers, the duration, the location potentially of, of the calls, that's also very, very critical information that adds to the insurance policy, if you will, and something that we need to consider whether it's worth getting. Thank you. Uh, so we have about what, uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions, um, so I'll take, is there a microphone? Great. So that gentleman there in the uh, aisle, if you, could you identify yourself, please, first? And then uh, sure. I'm Joel Meyer uh, with Data Miner, uh, a uh, uh, real-time information company recently with the government. I want to ask the panel about where they think the general public's view of privacy is going. The, the question is consensus here, and I think clearly laws are, are laws and there, there's a lot of technical aspects to them, but they can be changed if the consensus changes. We live in a world now where um, we have a billion people around the world, a sixth of humanity or a seventh on, on Facebook. We have uh, people tweeting things intentionally into the public domain, their thoughts and observations in ways that were not never possible before. Um, 
So there, there's a gener there may be a gener generational aspect to it, whatever, but clearly part of the question here is, if we're talking about a trade-off, are people more willing to be part of the haystack um, than they were before, and, and is that relevant? Good question. Uh, would, would like to take a stab. Um, I, I think there's no question that especially the younger generation is, is somewhat more uh, willing to uh, or believes that they care less about their privacy. What's interesting is that um, they are thinking in terms of Facebook privacy. They are thinking in terms of things that they put out there um, for their friends. And I, ha I had an interesting interaction with my 20-something-year-old cousin where she said, I don't care, I have nothing to hide. And we were having lunch and she looked terrible that day because she was sick and she had just rolled out of bed and she was wearing sweatpants and, and I grabbed my iPhone. I took a picture and I said, I'm gonna post this right now. She said, no, you're not. I said, see, you don't put everything on the internet. You choose. And so it's not a question of how much people make public today versus how much they made public a while, you know, generations ago. The question is, what is your level of control? And if you want to share something with 500 friends, that's great, but you still retain the ability today, or you should, to say, not 501, just 500, even if once upon a time you said 20. So, the, the, and when you explain it in those terms, people actually do care about privacy more than they think. You know, the same thing if, if, you know, if an iPhone, this is sort of a thought experiment that's been done by, by people doing focus groups, you know, if an iPhone pops up and says, share your location or whatever, people say yes, they don't think about it. If another window were to come up to say, and this location may also be shared with the NSA, people say no. They don't want it shared with the NSA. They don't think it's being shared with the NSA. So it's complex. There is a general overall sense in the public that they value their privacy less. But when they are brought to the specifics of whether they want some control over whether their information goes to the government, they do. They want that control. And I think we'll see that play out in this debate. Right. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? All right. Next question. Chris. Thanks. Uh, Chris Strom with Bloomberg News. Um, I'm wondering about uh, the whether you see anything uh, shaping up in terms of changes to the um, activities that's taking place under 12333. Um, it seems like that the administration has talked about some areas where they're open to, to actually you know, making some changes, such as limitations on spying on foreign leaders and maybe possibly Fourth Amendment protections for foreign citizens. And so I guess this is probably a question for Darren and, and David um, in terms of you know, can you say anything about what you're hearing from the administration? And, you know, it also seems like that the administration is saying, don't make any substantive changes to 215, but, you know, maybe we can make some changes to what's taking place under 12333. And I'm wondering kind of, you know, where you see that going. Um, <coughs> the administration hasn't officially, well, actually, the administration even unofficially hasn't said anything to us about changes under 12333. Um, I, I've read the same articles you've seen and, and heard the same quotes, but there's been no formal discussion. And um, with respect to changes under 215 or 702, the administration has conducted a review and has come up and briefed the committee on, on its review. and. Um, I don't want to prejudge what the committee might do since it hasn't acted, unlike, unlike David's committee. But um, I, I, it is accurate to say that, you know, they've taken a look at different, different ways of conducting these programs and really can't find a solution, a workable solution that gives the same counterterrorism efficacy um, to a construct other than the one that they have right now. Uh, David. I, I'd largely agree with that. Um, I think the, the internal uh, administration review is still very much uh, underway, and, and when, when they have something that they are ready to roll out, I'm, I'm sure we'll hear about it. Um, I do want to just make a, a general comment about EO 12333. Um, I, th I think that it has not been widely understood. Uh, so we're, we're talking here about Executive Order 12333. Um, I don't think that there were 12,332 before it, but uh, <laughs> begun under the Reagan administration and, and revised periodically since then. Um, it is the, the, the general regulation that covers 
all intelligence activities in this country, um, or by this country, I should say. Um, just about everything that is done by the CIA, uh, the uh, imagery satellites we have overseas, much of NSA's work is all EO-12333 collection. FISA is governed by EO-12333 collection in addition to be, being covered by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Uh, so every year, the, the executive branch and the Congress engage in, a, in debates over trade-offs within EO-12333 collection. It's called the budget. Um, so if you want to add a dollar to NSA SIGINT collection overseas, and we're in a budget-constrained environment, which we very much are now, it's got to come from somewhere. And so it's going to come from, for example, um, you know, a, the ability to conduct radar satellite imagery from you know, some other part of the, of the world. And so it's a trade-off. And, and what goes into that trade-off are policy considerations, uh, but also intelligence in need. What is a higher priority to be able to collect this or to collect that? And how are the various ways we can collect this? And how expensive are all, all the different setups? And what are the legal frameworks? And what, are we, uh, you know, what do our customers say is uh, of more value to them? If I'm a combatant commander, do I value having the communications of my en enemy more than I value having a spy infiltrated in them. I mean, these are simplistic examples, but, but those trade-offs go on all the time. Um, and and I, I think increasingly, uh, because of, of the discussions we're having right now, part of those discussions will also involve, you know, what is the policy, what do we, f how, how do we feel about this nature of collection from a, um, from a policy point of view, I, I'd, I'd hasten not to call it ethical or moral. I think those are the wrong, the wrong terms to judge it. But um, the, these debates go on all over the place, um, and, and they, are, they are legal, budgetary, policy, effectiveness, um, uh, how much something is subject to compliance violations goes into it. If something is, is too hard to implement, then often it won't be implemented. Could, could I just take moderator's pr prerogative to ask a quick follow-up question since you, you raised the very good uh, issue of the 12333 collection and that I think w one of the uh, issues coming out of recent stories in s based on Snowden disclosures is the fact of sort of uh, U.S. person and non-U.S. person data collected overseas um, that is not subject to, for instance, obviously the FISA regime. Given the sort of the borderless nature of the internet, and the fact that uh, some, sometimes U.S. person data is caught up in some of this collection. Is this distinction between collection on U.S. soil and non-U.S. soil meaningless now? I mean, is that dichotomy almost sort of meaningless in the, given the borderless nature of the Internet? Darren, David? I, I don't think the distinction is meaningless. I, I, I think maybe the, the scope of um, information available or the, um, the amount of information collected from one place or the other may have changed. Um, the ease of access may have changed, but the distinction remains. And um, I think it's important to note that uh, while 12333 collection isn't necessarily, it doesn't occur necessarily under the FISC and isn't regulated by the FISC, um, there are guidelines and, and rules and regulations about what happens if U.S. person information is collected incidentally or otherwise under 12333. So that, you know, I, I think it's an important distinction, and, but I, I, I don't think we should walk away with the idea that, well, if we're under 12333, we don't care whether or not it's U.S. person. That's, that's not accurate at all. I, I would add just briefly sure. to that, Ellen. Um, you know, the, 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 it's not a dichotomy in the way that you described it so much as it is FISA allows for collection that is <coughs> obtained inside the United States. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there is a constitutional assumption that someone in the United States gets constitutional protection. Uh, but we do spend a lot of time uh, recently talking about Section 702, which covers collection of, of foreigners outside the United States. Um, we spent a lot less time talking about Section 703 and 704 of FISA, which actually, for the first time, imposed a warrant requirement if the government wants to collect information about an American overseas. Uh, previously, it didn't require a court, the court to sign off that there is probable cause to believe that this U.S. person was a, a foreign power, an agent of foreign power, and now you do. It was previously an, a, a solely 
executive branch determination. The Attorney General could say, go ahead and do surveillance on, on that American overseas. Okay. Um, unfortunately, it's also a fact of life that, that um, it's not an us versus them, Americans versus non-Americans. It is an unfortunately real uh, part of, uh, of our society that there are homegrown terrorists and, and naturalized citizens and U.S.-born citizens who are also terrorists or spies or whatever else. Um, and the government can't simply say, we're going to, you know, uh, avoid collection. Uh, no, uh, and for them, they get the probable cause warrant and go up. They, they, they do, and, and there are law enforcement tools and, and others. Um, but I don't, I don't want to, you okay. know, it, it's, it's, it, it's well, too easy to say that it's purely foreign versus domestic. You know, you need, you need to fair lo point. look at one, the I think we have guys. time for one more question, sorry. Uh, sir, the, yeah. You have to shout. Uh, Steve Winters, local researcher. Uh, I, I heard Admiral Mullen speak about a year ago, and he made the point it's a, not just a question of defending the country or the security of the country, but you also have the values that the country stands for. And he expressed the view, I was quite surprised to hear actually from him, that he thought that we're losing touch with those values over the last decade or so. And you might reach a point at which you're defending the country, but you're not defending the values that the country stands for. Uh, when Church, I'm old enough to remember the Church period, uh, he was very unpopular with the agencies. A lot of people really resented and what his is your reforms. Question, sir? Church. I what said, is your question? The question is I haven't heard anything about what values might be at stake here, peculiar American values. Presumably, that was what Snowden has stated he was standing up for. So are, is there a value issue here that has anything to do with this country? Are we, or as Mullen said, do we just end up defending a country and the values aren't there anymore? Presumably Church was defending the values that he thought America stood for. Okay. Um, I know that, um, so we took, we, the committee, took about almost 30 members of uh, the House Republican Conference who are not on the committee out to NSA uh, a little over a week ago to get uh, a variety of briefings and, um, and one of the things they, they received was a briefing from some uh, analysts who were on, who had been working that week, this was on a Monday, who had, who had worked over the weekend um, and had worked d um, directly with the director to use the NSA system to, because U.S. forces in Afghanistan um, had become aware of a threat to a, a particular location in Afghanistan. And so they, and the the U.S. forces in Afghanistan requested additional assistance from NSA, and, and um, so that weekend they brought to bear NSA's capabilities to try to identify this threat and um, mitigate it. And the folks who were giving the briefing about what they had done and the nature of the threat and what they did um, were all um, very dedicated to the service of this country. Uh, and that's what motivated them to be there. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think any of us can speak for the values of, uh, um, speak to the, the commitment of values to the individual men and women at any of the elements of the intelligence community or to the people who conduct oversight in the various uh, oversight organizations. But, uh, I mean, I, I just know from my own personal experience that, um, there are a lot of very dedica dedicated people who take their service seriously, who could go um, get other jobs and get rewards that you can't get working for the government, um, and who are, are very dedicated to their mission. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I guess um, we can all point to examples of people who don't share the values that uh, of the United States, but I. I can't make a, a broad conclusion um, that that we've departed from that. Thank yeah. you, Darren. We'll give Sean the last word. In Sorry, there. I, um, maybe tying it back to the theme, consensus. I think there is consensus about uh, 
the respect that we have for the dedicated professionals in, in, in the intelligence community at the NSA, the fact that folks work tirelessly day in and day out. Um, I want to kind of go back to the question, though, in terms of the values and the principles that um, we are, I think, should be talking about. I think Senator Leahy has been trying to talk about in terms of the values and principles of the Constitution, of privacy, about the fact that individuals have some expectation that if the government is going to be taking their information and looking through their information, that there should be a reason for it, and that reason should be justified, and that if it's for intelligence purposes or foreign intelligence purposes, that there should be some connection between that individual's information and a foreign intelligence purpose. And I think it goes back to the issue of not necessarily impugning or questioning the integrity of the professionals, as Darren's talking about, those folks are working and doing what they're supposed to do because that's their job. They're doing what they're told to do based on what the law is. The question for the policymakers is what should that law be? Should the law allow for the bulk collection of, or of telephony metadata? Should the law allow for potentially the bulk collection of other types of data? And how does that match up against the values of our nation not just now, not just in the past, but going forward, especially as technology develops. Okay, well, I'm sorry that we didn't have time to get to all of your questions, but um, if maybe the panelists can stay for just a few minutes, maybe you can come up and ask them. But I think we're going to have to uh, wrap it up now. Uh, seems like we weren't able to find a consensus yet, but we, have our cons we do have consensus that we are working toward it and can try to work toward it. So uh, thank you very much for staying with us today.